my name is Brad Gregory. I teach in the history department here at Notre Dame. I'm honored to introduce tonight's keynote speaker, Professor Alistair McIntyre, who is now Senior Research Fellow at the Center for Contemporary Aristotelian Studies and Politics at the London Metropolitan University. He is also, of course, the John A. O'Brien Senior Research Professor of Philosophy Emeritus at Notre Dame. I'm sure I speak for everyone in saying we are delighted to have him with us this evening as our featured lecturer. Speaker introductions are a genre notoriously prone to hyperbole, but I face a little risk of that this evening. It's simply a fact to say that Professor McIntyre is one of the most influential and important philosophers in the world. In a publishing career that now spans more than six decades, he has written more than 30 books, published more than 200 articles or book chapters, and has taught at Oxford, Princeton, Vanderbilt, and Duke, as well as at Notre Dame. He is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, the British Academy, and the Royal Irish Academy. He is probably best known for After Virtue, a study in moral theory, now in its third edition, which was followed by two other major works about the formation and transformation of rival traditions of moral reasoning, whose justice, which rationality, and three rival versions of moral inquiry. His most recent book, God, Philosophy, Universities, A Selective History of the Catholic Philosophical Tradition, was published in 2009 and touches on issues pertinent to this conference, including the secularization of knowledge and its institutionalization in the defining structures and guiding assumptions of higher education. A key emphasis in Professor McIntyre's thought is his paradoxical argument that moral philosophy is never only about moral philosophy. Morality, never just about morality. Both also and inevitably concern the rest of human life, and both also and inescapably are the product of the human past that has made the present what it is. Moral ideas inform concrete human practices, those practices are embedded in social relationships, and those relationships are shaped by political and economic institutions. Hence, ethics is never just about individual moral agents obeying or disobeying the rules of right and wrong. It's always and inevitably about the kinds of lives we live together with others as embodied creatures in particular social, political, and economic contexts. And these contexts are interwoven with traditions that are the product of historical processes. We can't understand our situation today in moral or any other terms unless we understand the historical influences that have produced it. The same applies to secularism and secularization. We make little progress by approaching them in themselves in any narrow sense, whether the decline in regular church going, the extrusion of religion from the public sphere, the ideological rejection of religious truth claims, or whatever. It would be folly to pretend, for example, that secularization has nothing to do with the dominance of consumerism and its colonization of human desires in our era of online shopping and wall-to-wall -wall capitalism. This awareness is reflected in Professor McIntyre's long-standing appreciation of the insights of Marxism and his criticisms of the morally corrosive effects of advanced modernity's capitalism, which is, as he puts it, quote, in its most basic forms, an expression of the vices of intemperateness and injustice and imprudence. Understanding secularization means understanding long-term, wide-ranging changes in the relationship of religion to economic institutions, social relationships, political power, dominant cultural values, and the ideological assumptions that govern the academy. As Professor McIntyre notes in God Philosophy Universities, these assumptions in higher education are evident in both Catholic and state universities. In both, knowledge is defined as secular and specialized, and the integration of highly segmented knowledge from different academic disciplines is not on the agenda natural scientists, social scientists, or humanistic scholars. No doctoral programs train scholars or scientists to aspire to such an end. So it is little wonder that students find no classes about how even to begin to think about how to integrate what they learn. As with morality and moral philosophy, there are historical reasons for this situation, some of which are related to religion itself. The widest ambition of theology, the understanding of God and relationship to all things, and so of all things in relationship to each other, was made all but impossible in the intellectually constrained Catholic and Protestant universities of early modern Europe that followed the Reformation. 
It was also severely hampered in Catholic universities and seminaries throughout the 19th and most of the 20th centuries because of a self-imposed quarantining of neo-scholastic philosophy and theology from so much new knowledge being made in other disciplines. One could not meaningfully ask questions about God in relationship to all things unless one knew, for example, what particle physics and evolutionary biology and historical critical methods of biblical interpretation disclosed that we didn't know before. Historically speaking, secularization is partly a function of the ignorant timidity and intellectual unpreparedness of many religious believers in the face of the world of learning. It is not merely the product of secularist assaults on religion in the name of science, progress, or radical emancipation. As a historian also trained in philosophy, I have been much influenced by Professor McIntyre, a philosopher whose thought is so historically minded. My forthcoming book on the unintended long-term effects of the Reformation owes a great deal to his thought. And so it gives me especially great pleasure to introduce Professor McIntyre this evening, whose lecture is entitled, On Being a Theistic Philosopher in a Secularized Culture. theistic, secularized culture. By this, I don't mean only that a large and growing number of our contemporaries, especially our educated contemporaries, have rejected religious belief, but that the basic assumptions that almost all of our contemporaries bring to inquiries and debates about our shared moral and political lives take for granted the practical irrelevance to those debates of any reference to God even when we open those debates with public prayer. But more than this, our conception of what it is that divides theists from atheists is in general a secularized, that is, an atheistic conception. The disagreements between theists and atheists, like most fundamental disagreements, extend to disagreement as to how those disagreements are to be characterized. And commonly nowadays, those disagreements are understood as atheists understand them, even by many professed theists. Let me give two examples. First, ours is a culture in which it's widely held that what theists and atheists disagree about, and have reason to disagree about, is the existence of God and only that. About everything else, about everything that comprises nature, that is, everything except God, there is, so it's widely believed, no reason to disagree. I contrast this view with what I take to be a genuine theistic understanding of that disagreement, that it concerns some aspects of everything. To be a theist is to understand every particular as, by reason of its finitude and its contingency, pointing towards God. It's to believe that, if we try to understand finite particulars, independently of their relationship to God, we're bound to misunderstand them. It's to hold to all explanation of understanding that doesn't refer us to God, both as first cause and final end, is incomplete, and that foremost among the finite particulars of which this is true are we ourselves as human beings. A second conviction of our secularized culture is that belief in the God of theism is to be understood as the expression of something called religion. Religion is an important classificatory label in secularized society, grouping together primitive animism, Greco-Roman and Hindu polytheisms, the theisms of Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, Joseph Smith and Mary Baker Eddy. So that the contrast is between so-called religion in all its various forms and non-religion, the secular. For aggressive unbelievers, religion, thus understood, is the name of an all-purpose trash can. While some believers consider Schleiermacher and Otto, and some unbelievers too, consider Feuerbach, have searched earnestly for the essence of religion. But this isn't how genuine theists understand things. For theists, the basic contrast is between those who worship God and those who make the highest object of their devotion 
some finite object or state. So, on this theistic classification, primitive animists, Greco-Roman polytheists, and atheistic 21st century professors and journalists, with their finite objects of devotion, all belong together, to be contrasted with practicing Jews, Christians, and Muslims. It follows that theists have no particular interest in defending religion as such, and have good reason for uneasiness when public discourse is framed in terms of a contrast between the religious and the non-religious. But I put this line of thought aside for the moment, though I'll take it up again later. Let me instead remark that it's also characteristic of our secularized society to believe that it is the argumentative disagreements between theists and atheists that are fundamental in characterizing what's at stake in evaluating theistic claims. What atheists assert is that theists need, but can't provide, compelling arguments. That is, on success or failure in argument concerning God's existence, right, sorry, that it is on success or failure in argument concerning God's existence that everything turns. This contrasts with the theistic belief that at a fundamental level, the differences between theists and atheists are of quite another kind. For theists, what matters most is not so much the issue of God's existence or non-existence. God's existence can in a way be taken for granted, as the contrast between his presence and his absence, between those occasions when he manifests himself in and through particulars, and those dark nights of the soul when he withdraws from us. To someone engaged in prayerful practice of the presence of God, whether a Hasidic Jew or Ignatian Christian or Sufi Muslim, the thought that perhaps God doesn't exist would be an idle thought, certainly not a thought to be responded to by philosophical argument, any more than the fanciful thought that some human friend from whom we only hear at long intervals has perhaps never existed. Of course, some skeptical philosopher might say that if there is indeed such a thing as genuine awareness of the presence of God, then the question of whether or not God exists should have been settled to everyone's satisfaction long ago. To which the only possible response is that of C.S. Peirce, that greatest of American philosophers, in his response to an objection posed to his own personalist theism that, and I quote, if there is a personal God, we must be in personal communication with him. Now, if that be the case, the question arises how it's possible that the existence of this being should ever have been doubted by anybody. To which first replied that, and I quote again, facts that stand before your face and eyes, sorry, facts that stand before our face and eyes and stare us in the face are far from being in all cases the most easily discerned. For to discern them we need not argument, but to be open to those facts, as Newman was open, when he perceived his own existence and that of God as luminously self-evident. I'm not, of course, implying that philosophical argument about the existence of God is pointless or unimportant, nor, of course, was Peirce or Newman. But its point and importance, so far as theists are concerned, is not to reassure us as to God's existence, but to exhibit the groundlessness of atheism. So theists argue, and I take the argument to be sound, even though it's rejected with some scorn by atheists, that if God didn't exist, there would be only finite and contingent particulars, perhaps an infinite chain of them. But there couldn't have been only finite and contingent particulars, for nothing could have sustained such particulars, whether an infinite or finite set, in continuing existence. That is, if God didn't exist, there would have been nothing. If God didn't exist, there would have been no atheists to say so. <laughs> so far then, I've identified two beliefs as characteristic of our post-Christian society. The belief that disagreement between theists and atheists is about God, but not about nature, and the belief that the crucial disagreements between theists and atheists are argumentative disagreements. Let me consider the first of these a little further by clarifying the nature of the disagreement between theists and atheists about how nature is to be understood. 
A widely held belief in our secularized culture is that the tasks of explanation and understanding are to be assigned either to the natural sciences and to the social sciences, sorry, either to the natural sciences or to the social sciences just in so far as they approximate the condition of the natural sciences. Explanation and understanding are correspondingly conceived so that only what can be explained by such sciences counts as explanation. The outcome is a proposition towards which theists and atheists take very different attitudes. Atheists assert that every type of particular, every event, and every state in nature can be explained by those sciences. To this, the theistic reply is that so long as you conceive of explanation as such atheists do, this is undeniably true. So about what then do we and they disagree? We and they disagree about how explanation is to be conceived. What natural scientific investigations enable us to explain is how finite beings have come to be what they now are and how they will come to be what they will be. Such investigations begin from a recognition that some particular type of cause has produced some particular type of effect and are then asking how, how on earth, we are to explain why and how such effects issue from such causes. The answer will be a more fundamental story of causal sequences that in turn invites explanation at a still more fundamental level. At the same time, we construct from the sequences provided by those causal explanations a narrative of the cosmos from as near to its beginnings as we can get to as far into the future as we can predict. So we move from everyday narratives that begin with the planting of seeds and end with the flowering and fruiting of apple trees to causal narratives that substitute for the beginning of this story an account of adjacent molecules and of chemical reactions between them. And finally, to causal narratives that substitute for an account of molecules and chemical reactions an account of fundamental particles and their interactions. None of these stories is in itself incomplete. The relevant sciences can always supply an account of what happened and of how it happened. And no degree of complexity defies explanation in these terms. But every such explanatory narrative cries out for further explanation, for explanation of how this particular input would have resulted in that particular output until, and here we approach the point at which theists and atheists disagree, what atheists take to be the final step, the step at which, having arrived at our narrative about quarks or leptons or bosons or whatever, it turns out that natural science has nothing more to add. But does this mean that nothing further requires explanation? Not at all. What still requires explanation is why the changes and chances of nature are such that they enable such striking transformations to take place. Consider one notable story about nature that we're now able to tell, a story like all the others of inputs and outputs. The inputs with which this particular story, the story of the genesis of human beings, begins are a set of hadrons, leptons, and bosons. The outputs with which it ends are a set of opera-loving, James Joyce-quoting, equation-solving, atheistic physicists. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> what makes it amazing is not at all the improbability of the outcome. Any particular statistical distribution of fundamental particles is, given their past distribution and the nature of their interactions, going to be highly improbable. Nor is it a matter of our being impressed by degrees of or kinds of complexity. Nor is it that there is some explanatory gap in the step-by-step -step story of how it all happened. What is amazing is that, given that input, any step-by-step -step narrative should lead to this extraordinary outcome. How can this be possible? What could have made it the case? Let me put those questions in another way. The account of the cosmos given by contemporary physicists has a place in it for hadrons, leptons, bosons, for strong and weak forces, for electromagnetism and gravitational attraction, and perhaps for strings and 11 dimensions. 
What it has no place at all for are physicists, nor indeed for any intentionally informed agents. If what contemporary physics asserts is true, it's difficult to understand how physicists are even possible. <laughs> Yet physicists are what in the end result from the interactions of particles. And that's not all. For physicists in the course of, say, bombarding protons and neutrons in order to verify the existence of quarks, alter the course of those particles so that they behave as the experimenter's intentions require and not as they would otherwise have done. Intentionally effective agents recurrently restructure this or that small part of the order of nature in accordance with their intentions. So here we have a story which both begins and ends with fundamental particles, but in which physicists themselves are the transforming agents. Science explains each of the steps in each of these stories. What it doesn't explain is why the stories have the structures and sequences that they do. Why a universe that is at its physically fundamental level devoid of intentionality should, as it moves thermodynamically towards its own destruction, generate not just intentionality, but such technicolor examples of intentionality as those provided by opera-loving James Joyce quoting equation-solving atheistic physicists. <laughs> Whatever might explain this, no yet-to-be-told story about fields or forces or particles or strings or something as yet to be identified will provide anything like what's needed for the problem just is that of explaining how any physical agency whatever, whatsoever could produce such an outcome. And here, of course, atheist and theist diverge. For atheists insist that there's no problem. They resolutely refuse to be amazed at their own existence. The atheist says that's just how it is. When explanation by physicists terminates, explanation terminates. Theists retort that if, when explanation of causal sequences in the physical world was first proposed long ago, the response had been that's just how it is, the scientific enterprise would never have been undertaken. And there is no more reason to be content with that's just how it is now than there was then. And so theists finally insist, after a further round of argument, that nothing can explain such relationships of input to output, nothing can make the workings of nature intelligible, except the will and purpose of some being whose intelligence, like his other powers, is not limited in the way that the powers of finite beings are limited, a being with unbounded abilities to astonish us. The disagreement of theists and atheists then is in key part about explanation, about what it is that requires explanation, to provide an explanation, and about what it is for an explanation to be complete or incomplete. Disagreement about the existence of God is, among other things, a consequence of disagreement about explanation. Are such disagreements about explanation rationally resolvable? If we take this to mean is there a prospect of atheists and theists agreeing upon what such a rational resolution would be, then the answer is plainly no. But this is not to concede that the issue is not rationally resolvable. For atheism here involves a diminished and restricted conception of explanation and understanding. And the onus is upon the atheist to justify the restriction, to show that our astonishment at the transformation of particles into physicists is not as much an expression of a legitimate demand for explanation as is our astonishment at the transformation of, sorry, is just, just as much an expression of a legitimate demand for explanation as is our astonishment at the transformation of seeds into apple trees. Note that I'm not here and now advancing an argument against the atheist, let alone an argument from premises that atheists would accept. What I'm pointing to is a disagreement about premises rooted in the atheist's incapacity for a certain kind of wonder. Atheists have no difficulty in appreciating aesthetically what are sometimes called the wonders of science, such structures as those of the eye or the DNA helix. But they are quite inadequately astonished by some features of the cosmos. The 19th century painter 
J.M.W. Turner, while walking in the Welsh mountains, suddenly and unexpectedly came upon a striking landscape. His response was to shout out, well done, God. <laughs> that, that was very much my own response when I first came across Richard Dawkins. And it's the capacity to, and it's the capacity to respond to nature in this way that is at the heart of theism, a capacity that tends to disappear as a culture is secularized. Let me turn now to another very different feature of our secularized culture. It's underappreciation of Nietzsche. It's reduction of Nietzsche to just one more philosophy, philosopher with one more set of theories. It's domestication of Nietzsche. Theists owe Nietzsche an enormous debt. For Nietzsche was the atheist who understood far better than any other what and how much the atheist's rejection of theism involves. If God does not exist, then no point of view is privileged. There is only my perspective on how things are, your perspective, her perspective, their perspective. And that is to say, there is no such thing as how things are. We may choose, of course, to privilege this or that standpoint, and we may construct a gene genealogy of this or that standpoint. But underlying all such projects are acts of self-affirmation expressed in our choice of standpoint. Many modern philosophers before and after Nietzsche have denied that this is so and have insisted that there is an ordered reality independent of and prior to our perceptions of it and our judgments about it, some of them as persuaded of the truth of atheism as Nietzsche was. What Nietzsche claims is that such philosophers have failed to recognize that their belief in such a reality is a vestige of a theism that they have been unable wholly to discard. And indeed, what followed in 20th century philosophy were a set of inconclusive debates between anti-realists and realists with respect to a variety of subject matters. So that while any, concep any conception of a God's eye view of things was and is found unacceptable, yet at the same time a reluctance to discard realism remained and remains as powerful as it was when Nietzsche first identified it and tried to undermine it. So at the level of theory, secularized philosophy inherits a set of unresolved and de facto unresolvable philosophical disagreements, while at the level of practice, there is a tacit agreement to privilege certain standpoints and to ignore the arbitrary character of that privileging, the standpoint of science as such the standpoint of morality as such, the standpoint of art as such, and sometimes even, as a counterpart to these, the standpoint of religion as such. What is missing here is any shared conception of an overall order of things and of the relationship of the particular findings of particular sciences, of the particular practical conclusions of ethics and politics, and of the particular makings of particular arts to such an overall order. Consider in this light what is currently presented as the standpoint of morality as such. At the level of philosophical theory, the key disagreements are those between quasi-Kantians, updated contractarians, and ever more sophisticated utilitarians. And the disagreements are not only between the upholders of each of these theoretical points of view, between, but also between those who believe that to hold any one of these sets of positions commits one to rejecting the other two, and those who hold that a great work of reconciliation between them is at least possible, and may perhaps have already been achieved with the publication this year of Derek Parfit's maximum opus on what matters. At the level of everyday moral practice, however, what we find is neither stark disagreement nor reconciliation, but rather an oscillation between on the one hand, unconditional affirmations of inviolable rights of various kinds, and on the other claims that this or that right can in this particular case be overridden in the name of the maximization of utility, perhaps the maximization of economic prosperity, or that of national security, or that of the therapeutic capacities of medical science. Rights that are in one context treated as inviolable 
are in another treated as not just open to being overridden, but such that we are required to override them. So economic progress may on occasion justify the destruction of types of neighborhood community, and national security may warrant the use of torture against terrorism. The resulting form of the moral rule in this culture is, for example, always tell the truth, always keep promises, always refrain from taking innocent life, except when. The catalogue of exceptions is one that is open to indefinite further extension and revision. And alongside the categories of the required, the prohibited, and the permissible, we now find the category of the indefinitely debatable, that about which we are able to agree to disagree, not only with others, but sometimes even with ourselves. I took note already that many such disagreements are between those who on some particular occasion uphold the inviolability of someone's right to have or to do or to be free from such and such, and those who hold that on this particular occasion our interest in securing this or that aspect of our well-being and our natural inclination to achieve our well-being are such that we ought to treat this case as an exception to an otherwise exceptionless rule. Since in the dominant culture there's available no shared impersonal standard by appeal to which such disagreements might be rationally adjudicated, they are in fact resolved, if at all, by some form of non-rational persuasion. Participants in such disputes often think of themselves as weighing a variety of relevant consideration. But the problem with this metaphor, as I've remarked elsewhere, is there aren't any scales. Yet the thought that there are no scales is one that those participants rarely have an opportunity to entertain. And this is not the only thought effectively excluded by this conception of moral precepts and moral debate. Imagine that someone were to attempt to intervene in contemporary public debate with a claim that we are unconditionally bound to obey a certain rule, not in spite of our interests and natural inclinations, but because of them. That our nature is such, that our end is such, that we cannot achieve it except by respecting a law to whose giver we are accountable. What such a one had to say would inevitably go unheard. I don't mean to imply by this that such a view might not be entertained, even if briefly and curiously, in the arenas of purely theoretical discussion. But in the arenas of everyday public debate, it would be too oblique to the terms of the controversies to secure a hearing, and it would be treated as an irrelevant interruption. So another effect of secularization is to make theism morally irrelevant, and often enough morally invisible. And this, too, has consequences. If God does not exist, then everything is permitted. This declaration that Dostoevsky put in the mouth of Ivan Karamazov has often been misinterpreted. Karamazov was not saying, Dostoevsky through Karamazov was not saying, that atheists are free from all moral constraints, that if atheism is true, anyone is morally free to do anything at any time. What Karamazov was saying, what Dostoevsky through Karamazov was saying, was that if we take atheism to be true, then there is no type of action, no matter how horrifying, of which we can be sure that we could never find good reason to perform it, that it would never be overwhelmingly and overridingly in what we took to be the general interest to perform it. Dostoevsky through Karamazov was not predicting Auschwitz or the Gulag. He was predicting the firebombing of Dresden and Tokyo, the saturation bombing of the Ruhr, the obliteration of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and the actions that caused the deaths of over 100,000 Iraqis since 2003. Dostoevsky was predicting not the crimes of the obviously wicked, but the crimes of the conventionally good, types of action that it's rational to prohibit unconditionally only if one is a theist. But it's just this kind of position that will appear at best groundless, at worst unintelligible, to those whose presuppositions are those of our secularized culture. 
It's worth remarking that in the attitudes and judgments characteristic of this kind of secularized morality, there's not a trace of relativism. If by relativism we mean the doctrine that there is no appeal beyond the contingently established standards of one's own culture, then there are, of course, and have been some very few philosophical relativists, most notably Richard Rorty. But I know of very few moral philosophers who have agreed with him. Gilbert Harmon anticipated him. And everyday moral discourse is even more inhospitable to Rorty's doctrines than were and are his professional colleagues. So that when apologists for the morality of Catholic or Protestant Christianity or Islam lament what they mistakenly take to be the moral relativism of the contemporary world, they add gratuitously to an unfortunate and indeed a stupid way to the misunderstanding of what it is that puts our secularized culture morally at odds with theism. A much deeper understanding, a much deeper misunderstanding is at the heart of the matter. It informs each of the three aspects of intellectual conflict between atheists and theists that I've considered so far. Their disagreement about the place that arguments concerning the existence of God have in defining the issues that divide them. Their disagreement about what it is to understand, to explain the natural world. And their disagreements about morality. In all three cases, it's not just that atheists and theists disagree, but that as I remarked earlier, they disagree about how to characterize their disagreement. And the debates between theists and atheists in the public arenas of our culture are generally and characteristically framed in terms that already presuppose the atheistic understanding of those disagreements. Theists who imprudently enter into such debates equally generally and characteristically invite their own defeat for they find themselves cast in the role of defenders of apparently untenable positions to the atheist, sorry, to the atheist who requires of the theist a conclusive argument for the existence of God, conclusive that is in the atheist terms, the theist has nothing conclusive to offer. To the atheist who demands that theology provides explanations of particular natural phenomena that are incompatible with and superior to those of natural scientists, the theists who accept that challenge from Archdeacon Paley contemporary intelligent design theorists convince no one but themselves. To the atheist who insists that neither moral judgment nor moral action require belief in God, the theist reply seems to violate both the autonomy of the moral sphere and the autonomy of the moral agent. Since the atheist's presuppositions in all three areas are widely shared in our secularized culture, it's not just atheists but the spectators of these debates who generally find the theistic case unimpressive. But this doesn't necessarily result in any straightforward rejection of theism. For our secularized culture is happy to find a place for the intellectually defeated theist within an area of thought and practice that it distinguishes sharply from the areas assigned to the sciences, to technology, to the arts, to morality, and to law and politics, the area of what it calls religion. What differentiates the sphere of religion from other spheres is that within it, everyone is free as a private person to define their own position. And no one is able to make effective claims for that position in any public sphere. Laboratories, engineering plants, museums and art galleries, law courts and political assemblies, and forums of institutionalized moral debate about rights and utility, these constitute the arenas of public life. Churches, synagogues, mosques, yoga classes, Zen Buddhist monasteries, New Age spirituality, all these belong elsewhere. Within the sphere of religion, you may assert almost anything, including denials of the denial of the public relevance of religion. But you will effectively go unheard outside that sphere, or rather you will be heard only insofar as what you say can be interpreted as a contribution to some other sphere, that of morality, theory, or politics. And indeed, there are those who think that a suitably attenuated theism can be a source of attitudes that are culturally valuable in those spheres. We would therefore be making a mistake if we supposed that a high degree of secularization and the survival and even flourishing of some kinds of religious belief and institution are incompatible. 
What matters is the emergence of a conception of religion that segregates religion from other concerns. In a theistic culture, the question is inescapably posed in each area of human life of what it is to acknowledge God in the activities of that area. And the answers that are given shape those activities, whether secular or religious, activities of philosophical and scientific inquiry, activities of artists and construction workers, activities of farmers and fishermen, activities of rulers and ruled. There are indeed in theistic cultures notable issues about the relationship of secular to ecclesiastical authority. But in such cultures, the exercise of secular authority involves an acknowledgement of God quite as much as does the exercise of ecclesiastical authority. It's only with the cultural defeat of theism by secularization that the secular becomes secularized. So finally, the question is posed. If what I've claimed is by and large true, what are the tasks of a theistic philosopher who inhabits our present culture? The word if is important. I have in this brief time done no more than sketch positions and gesture at arguments. You almost certainly remain unconvinced of much that I've said, and rightly so. But if you were to be convinced, what would be the implications for those tasks? Some of them, of course, would be what they've always been, to work within and extend our own traditions of philosophical inquiry, Jewish, Christian, and Islamic, Augustinian and Thomist, phenomenological and analytic, entering into conversation and debate with each other, as well as with such great critics of theism as Hume, Diderot, Feuerbach, Russell, Sartre. But now we have to make ourselves more aware than we have been of the difficulty in framing the terms of debate in the current intellectual climate. We have to remain good listeners who are responsive to our critics but not make ourselves the victims of those critics. Instead, we need to redirect the debates by focusing on the philosophical presuppositions of our critics and making them and their position, rather than theism, the matter for debate. We have to portray accurately and sympathetically the secular and secularizing cast of mind so that we can exhibit ruthlessly the distortions, the weaknesses, the moral, scientific, and metaphysical vulnerabilities of that cast of mind. And this is something that we've so far, by and large, failed to do. Our most notable predecessors in this task were not by profession philosophers. I think especially of some of Chesterton's journalism and of some of Evelyn Waugh's novels. What we now need are thinkers who combine philosophical acumen and argument with the wit of Chesterton and the satire of war. That, you may say, would take a miracle. <laughs> Miracles, of course, can never be ruled out. But what it would certainly take is a new kind of philosophical education. What kind of education would that be? Happily, that's a question for another occasion. McIntyre has agreed to take questions from the audience. There are two microphones uh, up in the balcony, two down below. Those who are interested in posing a question, please come forward. Hi, Professor McIntyre. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I had a, a, a couple of questions. I was hoping, uh, first of all, if you could expand a little on your comment. Uh, you mentioned that if God does not exist, then no perspective is privileged. So I guess I'm wondering from the standpoint of a theistic philosopher uh, trying to engage uh, contemporary culture, uh, does that mean that if we withhold and uh, in a sense uh, play the game by the secularist rules, assuming there is no God, uh, we have no, no chance of establishing any kind of privileged perspective? Uh, I guess I'm wondering if, that, if that's a claim or is it a claim about the requirement of revelation or both? Um, and I, I guess second thing, I guess you, I, wonder, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the role for, of arguments for God's existence from the theist's point of view. Uh, let me, I, I, the second question is just, that's going to take much too long. 
Let me deal with the first as briefly as I can. What I was doing there was talking about what Dostoevsky meant in Brothers Karamazov when he puts it out of even Karamazov the claim that if God exists, everything is permitted. And this is a quotation that has been much misused. It has been said of Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky seems to hold that if you're an atheist, you can't have moral standards. You can't actually believe in anything. And that could clearly be silly. Um, in fact, this isn't at all what Dostoevsky uh, meant, as a careful reading of the novel reveals. He means that belief in God and belief in a law that is God's law goes along with a prohibition of certain types of action that is absolute and unconditional. And he contrasts with this the practice of a society where there is no belief in such a law and therefore no belief in genuinely unconditional prohibitions. Where in fact certain types of horrifying action which everybody would recoil from in many circumstances, these are proposed but in these circumstances, something so important is at stake that we may do this or that. And in fact, he was talking about what has been characteristically the practice in the 20th century and the 21st century of the, those who have been the decision makers for government of the major powers. He was talking of things like the saturation bombing of the Ruhr, the fire bombing of Tokyo, and the bringing about of 100,000 and more de deaths of civilians in Iraq. These are the kinds of crimes that are ruled out under any circumstance according on a theistic view, but not on a secularized view. I've merely tried to repeat more clearly what I tried to say the first time. I hope it helps. Dr. McIntyre, you convinced me yep. with, with, your, with your presentation, am I correct? And, um, I guess as I wrestle with that question of theistic, atheistic, if I'm not mistaken, I see the origin in neo-Thomistic terms. And I see a little bit of um, the Lockean strong and weak argument that's, that's behind that. And then the question that you pose and at the end is where do we go with this? I'm very deeply convinced, and working with a couple of people, I have to say much brighter than I, thanks be to God, who are convinced that we may be able to um, put forward a persuasive argument along scotistic lines to answer that question that you raised at the end. No, I, I'm just more skeptical about that, I'm afraid. Okay. Uh, very good uh, lecture, Professor McIntyre. Uh, I noticed that, as you define it, secularization is consistent with a very high level of religious belief and practice. It just has to be placed in a certain way. In, that, I'd like, in light of that, I'd like you to comment on the following phenomenon. During the Iraq War, uh, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld uh, fed uh, President Bush uh, selected biblical quotations along with the usual uh, reports of what was going on in order to fortify Bush's resolve to proceed with the war. Uh, what do you make of this kind of use of religion? Sorry, I, I couldn't hear the, the last part of the question. What, the, the last part is, what do you make of this no, kind no, of... But I didn't hear... I, after the President Bush, I just couldn't oh, hear I'm the word. Oh, uh, he f Rumsfeld fed, fed Bush uh, a sequence of, along with the usual reports of what was going on, a sequence of biblical quotations, which, whose intent and effect was to reinforce Bush's determination to continue with war. Uh, what do you make of this kind of use of religious rhetoric or whatever you want to call it? I don't want at this point to talk about individuals. That would no, involve... I didn't mean to make this a what you think of Bush question. No, no, I, I wasn't... Let me, let's take... begin with rather different examples. Um, when the Second World War began, it was taken for granted by the political leaders in the United Kingdom for the most part 
that there were certain kinds of action that you could not, in fact, engage in. And there was a very deliberate attempt in bombing strategies to distinguish between legitimate targets and illegitimate targets which would have involved the death of large numbers of civilians. It then turned out to be the case that if you conducted your bombing strategy in this way, you were not in fact going to defeat Germany's industrial war effort. And there was painful debate when for the first time bomber crews were told what the bombing patterns were to be on their next flights. They did in fact initially refuse to fly those missions. I knew one of the pilots involved. The Air Ministry sent down people who argued with them. They argued together for the better part of a day and then they finally were convinced and flew the missions. And this turned into saturation bombing of large areas which simply meant killing large numbers of innocent people on a huge scale. Uh, it's very easy to argue that without this, Britain would not have helped to win the war. And that was, of course, argued. Uh, it's notable that the person who was responsible for implementing this policy never received any public honours after the war, unlike everyone else of the same rank. So a kind of moral worry about this persisted even though people were willing to do it. I take it this was one of the very decisive moves into a completely secular view of things in which there can be a justification in the end for any type of act whatsoever at the level of practice. If we go to the Iraq war, the point about the Iraq war is that Nobody set out with a policy designed to kill Iraqi civilians. What they set out with was a policy that had, in fact, if you thought it through, no completing point, no point of completion, no way of implementing what you originally said you were going to do, something about which people have fussed and fudged for several years now under the present administration. And what you in fact did was unleash a policy which led to, on a rather conservative estimate, well over 100,000 Iraqi deaths. And for that, if you launch this war, you are responsible. In fact, people don't go around saying, I have yet to hear anyone in the public realm say that those who launch this war are accountable in this way. I don't name individuals here because quite apart from the members of the administration that launched the war, it received not quite but the near unanimous support of the Congress. And uh, let me ask you a question because I take it that in the audience there must be some Americans. Um, <laughs> but if you were American or indeed British since the British government went along with this policy very closely, if you were American or British, uh, ask yourself, how careful have I been to ask how many Iraqis were being killed? Very interesting that in the American press, the number of American dead has been tallied very accurately and continuously, and quite rightly. This is an entirely required and honorable thing to do. What nobody has tallied in this way are the number of Iraqi deaths that were in fact the major cost of bringing about regime change in Iraq, regime change which in a appalling kind of cosmic joke is going to end up with your having created the strongest ally for Iran that you can. So at this point, this kind of moral action is something that needs to be scrutinized and to ask what would it be to have a law that unconditionally prohibited this. And the argument, and I'm not going to give the argument here, the argument is it is only with something that has the prescriptive force of divine law understood in certain terms that you can understand why we are absolutely forbidden, whatever the consequences, to do certain things.
Yes, I mean, it's, this is, you've made exactly my point, rather. Uh, that is, he was doing a very bad thing, so I can do something as bad too. You're saying, no, if I'm concerned by it, I'm, if I'm concerned by it morally, I may be concerned by it in two ways. I may ask, what can I do about it, among all the things about which I should do something? Uh, and that, as a matter of fact, uh, I had a certain concern with. What I cannot do is bring this in as something to be weighed in the scale. Uh, the answer, if, if you criticize the saturation bombing of the Ruhr, you get exactly the same thing. You said, are you really concerned about Hitler's concentration camps? So there's always this kind of reasoning brought in. But you've put the voice of the holy secular extremely well and also vindicated my view of the relation between secularization and religious profession. No. Of course you can't. <laughs> How could you? My reaction to your talk is similar to Turner's reaction to the English landscape. <laughs> I'm deeply troubled, not just now, but perennially, by the worry that you articulated very well that atheism, having defeated theism on its own terms, relegates it to the sphere where it it can express itself without danger of overthrowing the atheistic order. I'm worried especially because that seems to be exactly what we're doing here, and I say that with the deepest and most profound respect for what we're doing here. Is this a legitimate worry? Can you spell it out a bit further so I know, know what it is? Yes. We've said a great many fine things tonight and at this time every year, things that have changed my life, but things that to my shock as a callow undergraduate had no effect on the world, at least none discernible on the major news networks. Is that something I should be worried about? And if not, how should I reconceive my job as a philosopher? I still, I'm sorry, I still haven't grasped the real question. I'll try one more time and then be yeah. silent. You spoke, I think, of the private sphere of religion, how theists are allowed to express themselves by the secularist order, right? Sure. Is that what we're doing? And should that bother us? Oh, sorry, good. Yeah, sorry. I think it's, it's very easy, on the one hand, to allow oneself to debate in terms that have been defined by the secular order, and that ensures that what you say will not really be heard, let alone assented to. On the other hand, I think that it is not too difficult to actually open up the debate in debate with the secular order so that you make the initial moves in the debate one that puts in question the terms in which the debate is going to be conducted. And that, I think, is what you have to do. You have to make these initial moves. And at this point, I think theists are in a much stronger position than they often recognize that they are. Because, in general, the secularized take it for granted. They, they, they haven't thought out the possibility that there might be an alternative perspective that the horizons might be different, that the light in which things might be seen might be quite other than they take them to be. In your remarks, you mentioned that people like the intelligent design theorists who frame their debates in terms that have already accepted the presuppositions of the secular order uh, are bound to lose and um, to perhaps even do harm to the theist's project by um, contributing to sort of discrediting its intellectual sophistication. Um, I was wondering if you could speak about perhaps some examples of proper ways to um, open up the debate as you were mentioning. So um, with, for example, the, the area of marriage, which is a huge area of, of public debate, do, um, do you think that you know, perhaps entering into that debate um, dialectically in ways that sort of question 
the, the premises that almost everybody is willing to accept. For example, the premises of uh, monogamy, lifelong commitment, and so on, and explaining that the, the secular mentality can't explain those premises, whereas atheist mentality can. Is that the sort of thing that you have in mind? I, yes. I mean, I think, let, let me not take the example of marriage, because that would require some other steps first. Um, but begin quite simply with one of the problems about the debates about abortion. Because the debates about abortion are very often conducted as though the issue of abortion could be abstracted from and treated separately from a general view of how children are to be thought of. And it's extremely important that care for the child has to be something that goes, lasts from conception, through birth, through early childhood, right until the adolescent can emerge into the adult world. And that from a theistic point of view, and this would be as true of Jews and Muslims as it is of Catholic Christians, the birth of a child is always a blessing. The conception of a child is always a blessing. Uh, you've then got to ask what it is to care for the child in this way, with a view to the child as someone who is going to grow up through all these stages. And one of the very sad things about much contemporary politics is that you will find on one side of political divide people who are deeply shocked, rightly so, by abortion, but not at all shocked by many other forms of childhood deprivation. Perhaps not even so they would think that they can talk about what's wrong about abortion without also talking about what's wrong about deprivation of various kinds, what's wrong with child abuse, because these are all part of the family of the same attitudes, the same crimes, the same and then you've got to ask, what's involved in giving the child what is owed to the child? And what is owed to the child is something that some children, of course, can't have for reasons that are quite outside anyone's control. But as far as possible, what is owed to the child is a particular kind of family life. And it's here that you have to sketch this family life. And this family life has to be one in which there are unconditional givings in which there are unconditional bonds. For without those unconditional bonds, the child can't have the kind of security that it needs. It's also the case that the child has to be uh, in a family where the parents are able to give the children the attention they deserve, are able to provide the children with what they need. And so the level of wages that is brought home, the question of whether in order for the family to survive economically, both parents have to have jobs, these are relevant questions too. Now, suppose we were to look at, we now make things very diffi more difficult for ourselves. Everybody's nodding. One of the most interesting things in this country, and it's nobody's fault. I mean, this, this has happened through a series of quite contingent happenings is that resources tend to go to the old and not to children. Um, I am against old people, including myself. <laughs> uh, and I'm against old people, including myself, because we are on the whole, we have been on the whole rather effectively greedy. Um, it's very important that if you ask what's owed to children, you're also going to have to ask What's owed to the old? You can't separate out these questions. And when the answers come down, they're going to be very tough answers, answers in terms of notions of taxation, notions of subsidy, notions of giving money to schools and the like. The Chicago Tribune earlier this week published the figures for the amount spent per head, per child, amount spent per child, in different schools in different areas in the Chicago area. There are areas around Chicago where the amount spent both in high schools and in primary schools on each child is of the order of $24,000. Uh, 
There are areas around Chicago where the amount spent on each child each year is $7,000. That kind of inequality is taking away from some children the possibility later on of participating in society in the way that the better off participated. And, well, I've gone on too long, but I take it I was making the point that you were trying to bring up here in another way, that we're basically in agreement. Is that right? Yes, yes, that's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Professor McIntyre, I, I, I don't know if you want to return to the subject of war and peace uh, and what was done in the context of wars, but I actually found the examples of extraordinarily striking, and I wondered if they aren't, in fact, perhaps the most striking examples of what you might take to be uh, the conception of secularization you're getting at. I confess to being an American who, uh, to my shame, turned a blind eye. Uh, and I, in fact, I remember particular instances, you know, reading the news, turning a blind eye, and so on. And when you were giving those examples, it struck me that perhaps as an example of secularization, as a, as a type of secularization, it, uh, one way of putting it might be um, that there's a way in which we secularize the enemy. That is, um, we have a long tradition, certainly within Christianity, I think Judaism does as well, and I think certain streams of Islam do as well, about thinking of, think how to think of the enemy. One tradition, um, obviously, is pacifism, and there's a place for that, certainly within Christianity, but that hasn't been, by and large, since the early history of the church, the way of thinking of the enemy as not someone you could engage as an enemy, but nonetheless not secularizing the enemy. And so I'm not sure that I have a question here, but perhaps pursuing with you or asking you to expand on that, uh, perhaps the notion of secularizing the enemy, particularly because you talk mostly as a philosopher uh, in terms of theism, which is, is a sort of common notion that doesn't distinguish between, say, religious traditions of Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. And there might be different ways in, with the, in which those religious traditions think about secu not secularizing the enemy. But in terms of theism, what, what would be available to us as theists, not as members of particular religious traditions, to avoid this notion of secularizing the enemy? Well, let me again begin from an example, and it's an example that will help to put in perspective perhaps some other things that I said. When I talked about the Iraq war, I was, not, I was talking about the accountability of the people who launched and sustained the war. I was not talking about the behavior, the deeds of the members of the United States Army and other military forces there. Because actually, by and large, the best people in America today are in the armed forces. What people who served in Iraq, particularly at the level of officers, captain and above, up to colonel, found themselves in was a situation in which they had to invent a way of carrying on the war that would in fact be adequately humane and that would in fact adequately recognize the problems of the local communities they were dealing with. And they in fact did, and have done, did throughout that war, a quite magnificent job. And it's very important that the military themselves do not have rules that they are allowed to waive uh, very important going back to the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War I take to have been in many ways an unjust war, but one again that was waged justly in many ways. It was quite common in Vietnam for someone in a forward position to be ordered to saturate a particular area with fire. This order would come from somebody who was say 25 miles away in the rear the person who was on the spot would immediately say, no, I can't do that. Um, there are nothing but civilians in this area. It would be military pointless, and in fact, you would be taking innocent life. Um, quite often, the order came back, do it. And at this point, it was also quite often the case that the officer on the spot simply disobeyed orders. If you disobey orders in the field in the American Army, 
What happens is that as soon as possible, the commanding officer, the relevant commanding officer, calls together a court of inquiry, three officers of the relevant rank, and they simply decide whether there is an occasion to move to court martial. During the Vietnam War, on no occasion on which someone disobeyed orders rather than take innocent life was anyone ever sent for court martial. Um, this was a quite extraordinary record of people insisting on obeying a code, which was indeed the military code, as they have in fact generally scrupulously done so in Iraq. There are of course the famous acceptance, exceptions, there are the atrocities, there are the cases when this breaks down. By and large, however, actually waging a war can be done without demonizing the enemy in the way that was suggested in the question. And what's very interesting is to ask, why have soldiers in various armies, not only in the American army, been so good at not demonizing their enemies? I think if we look at the empirical material here, there's a lot to learn. What kind of God is required for the James Joyce reading physicist to exist and for us to be able to think properly? Do we have to accept Christian theism? Can you just believe in an unmoved mover of some sort? What God do we need? Certainly an unmoved mover won't help you very much. Uh, <laughs> that, 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 that's very clear. Uh, but it's also very clear that um, the line between God whom we can respond to only on the basis of his self-revelation so that revealed truth is essential to taking any account of what it would be to stand before God. We don't have to have revealed truth in that strong sense to have a belief in God that is a belief in the divine lawgiver of the kind to whom we have to be responsive, not just to the law, but also to him as lawgiver. It's very important that when Aquinas speaks about the natural law and about the duties that we have under the natural law, among those duties are duties to God that by the light of reason, rightly understood, we apprehend a God who gives us a law, and he is the kind of God who would give us that kind of law. And we respond to him as the God who understands us in this way. So this notion of God is built up out of the history of responses to God as lawgiver, and here, the history of Israel, the history of Christianity, the history of Judaism, the history of Islam, all provide us with examples of people who find themselves asking, what would it be for me in this situation to take God seriously as lawgiver, and to reflect on this in a way that does not appeal only to the particular revelation to which they would be responding in their prayers. Uh, <clears throat> Professor McIntyre, I take it in your talk you suggested that disagreements between theists and atheists were disagreements uh, about many things, but about the nature of explanation itself. Not only about God, but about nature and particulars such as, for example, the nature of the human person. If that's true, how do they talk? So, as a theist, if one were a theist, right, you know, how does one go into such conversations with uh, non-theists, or perhaps even theists, but you know, how does one enter into, is it possible to enter into a reasonable discourse, and how? It depends on the context, it depends on the atheist, um, it depends on lots of things. And characteristically, it won't begin, the conversation won't begin as a conversation about God at all. It'll begin as a conversation about something 
quite different, in which it will only emerge that belief in God also is at stake. Um, it's quite common these days for a certain kind of scientific naturalist to say that there really aren't such things as human beings. Um, I could un I'm not going to take the time to set out the argument, but they presume that, they take it that our ordinary conception of ourselves as human beings is in fact incompatible with what neuroscience and other sciences disclose about the nature of the self. And when I'm in a seminar or a meeting or some other place where somebody says that sort of thing, my first remark is always, you wouldn't say this if this wasn't a philosophy seminar, would you? This isn't something that you could actually believe outside this very odd context in which one is allowed to say indefinitely bizarre things. <laughs> um, and they tend to get very cross at this point. Um, but if they are, get over their crossness long enough to talk, one wants to say that the way to proceed here is to ask just why people are prepared to say certain things in some contexts which they wouldn't be prepared to stand by in others. And oddly enough, that could be the beginning of a conversation that took one back to what it is to think about the universe in terms of God. When it comes to critiquing uh, the secularis sec secularism or exposing the presumptions of secularism, um, do you think Christians have done enough um, collaborating with Jews and Muslims to, to accomplish that? And uh, the second question is, do you think there's promise in that? And if so, are there challenges to that? I think that when really important dialogue uh, take, can take, takes place as it does from time to time uh, between Catholic Christians and Jews, Catholic Christians and Muslims, Muslims and Jews, this is, these are always quite extraordinary events these days. And those occasions which I happen to know about at first hand or very nearly at second hand are occasions in which it seems to me that you actually have the, the beginning, the developing of a set of attitudes that we can call theistic, attitudes that aren't Catholic but not Jewish or Muslim, Jewish but not Catholic or Muslim and so on. And that it's there that you understand what the force of being a theist is. Um, and in which you also come to realize how very clearly it is one and the same God that the believers of these different religions actually worship and know that they are in the presence of when talking about their profound theological differences about it. So I take it it's at the level of practice, at the level of actual discussion. Uh, in Ireland, the relationships now between the Islamic community, the Catholic Church, the Protestant churches are very remarkable and they developed out of a set of contingent accidents, people happening to meet, people having a problem and happening to raise it with the right person. And out of this there developed a respect and an ability to talk to each other um, which provides one of the most positive things that have gone on religiously in Ireland in the last five years. It's an awful lot has gone on negatively in Ireland. Um, so I would want to then spell out in these particular cases why this was important. Um, I very, I mean, for me, the climax of a great deal of this was a visit by the then president of Ireland, Mary McAleese, who's just yesterday or the day before stopped being, ceased being president, uh, who was a visitor to, there is now a national Islamic school in Ireland. And when she went to visit it, uh, she herself being Catholic, the children responded to her by first of all chanting the Quran to her in Arabic, but 
Ben singing our national anthem in Irish. And they were very clear to her, we are Irish Muslims. And this came about through the activities of, in the first instance, Church of Ireland, bishops and clergy, Catholic bishops and clergy, in responding to the pro questions and problems that Muslims in Ireland had in such a way that there is no kind of conflict or tension here, though there is a recognition of the great differences that there are between the religions. That's an enormous achievement to have brought off, even on a small scale. And when it happens elsewhere, and it has happened elsewhere, it's just as impressive. Thank you very much, Professor McIntyre. Um, recently, um, I'm in the seminary, and recently they read to us a statement by the Congregation of the Clergy which stated that the priests of this generation need to be countercultural. Sorry, I, I didn't hear that. That the priests of this generation need to be countercultural. Now, I think that that's a call that doesn't apply merely to the Catholic priest, not even to the Catholic or the Christian, but to the theist generally. And I think, though, that I have two concerns with that kind of a blanket statement um, in the secularist culture that we're called to be countercultural in. And one extreme is either that we're so countercultural, and I think this is a, an, an observation you raised at the beginning, we're so countercultural, there's, no, there's nowhere to even begin the communication. We, we stand apart, we secularize ourselves apart from the rest, and we are incapable of discussion, or the other extreme ends up being that we lower our, our own teachings, our own theistic views down to a kind of new, Newman's you know, criticism of liberalism to a point where then religion itself and theistic thought becomes irrelevant and a kind of plurality. So how do we avoid those two extremes, assuming those are both wrong in a theistic philosophy? It matters very much that I was talking about how, what it is to be a theistic philosopher in this culture. And I was talking about the way in which the shape that disagreements take when they're articulated at the level of argument, at the level of explicit philosophical discourse. I wasn't talking in the same way. I was, what I had to say touched, of course, on other areas of life. But it's very important that I wasn't recommending a counter-cultural attitude throughout life. And I couldn't do that because we are part of this culture. I mean, we are all secularized to a very high degree. When I said that holding religious beliefs didn't prevent one from being secularized, I wasn't talking about some strange minority of people outside. I was talking about us, including me. Um, I think it's very, very important that we don't think of contemporary culture as us versus them, but as conflicts which different people in different groups have partially resolved in different ways, but which are inside all of us. So that when we deal with secularization, the first people we're dealing with are ourselves. Um, and that makes a lot of difference to how you talk to other people. Um, does that into. I mean, it does. I think because I mean, I think the, the overarching question is how does one be both American and Catholic? And I don't think that those necessarily need to stand in opposition to each other. I think there's a necessity to be an American theist, an American Christian, an American Catholic, if I'm understanding you correctly. Oh, sure. I, I mean, how one stands to the culture depends upon what culture we're in. I mean, I am in fact. Uh, part of a secularized culture, it just doesn't happen to be American culture. Um, but you can't be, there's no culture today that is not secularized in this way. Um, and it's remarkably interesting if you look at, for example, the difference between what it's like to be a Catholic in Poland now, what it's like to be a Catholic in China now, what it's like to be a Catholic in this country now, in every case, when you start spelling the story out in cultural detail, uh, you find that they're all people dealing with secular cultures, and that in each case, the secularization is inside the Catholic as well as elsewhere in the culture.
Professor McIntyre, um, it's a privilege for me to hear you in person. I've read many of your books, and I haven't had the pleasure of reading your book on the university. Um, but I want to ask a question about, uh, I've always been impressed by <clears throat> the centrality of practices for your work. And I want to ask a question about the centrality of the practices of prayer that ordered uh, knowledge, the true, uh, art, the beautiful, um, the precepts of Matthew 25, uh, the good, uh, that both were ordered by and ordered toward prayer. Um, and insofar as the university is separated from those practices of prayer, what's the point of a theist being in a university? We're going to lose where there's a domain of knowledge uh, that acts autonomously and independent of the practices of prayer for the Christian theist. I, I mean, I wish we had three hours. Um, <laughs> and there are people here who would have much more important things to say than I do about this. But this goes very near the heart of the matter. Um, let me put it like this. We think about certain aspects of our religious belief as part of our public conversation. So that we're very happy to talk about what we believe as Catholics or what our view of this or that is as Catholics with non-Catholics, with atheists, with anyone. But we tend to talk of, think of our prayer as part of the private part of our life. And this not only about the prayers that we ourselves say, but about the liturgy of the Catholic Church. This is something where, after all, very few people are there who are not Catholics. This is us together. It's very important that we present ourselves to other people as people who pray. That the practice of prayer is what discriminates us in a very large way. And that what it is to present oneself as somebody who prays is to open oneself up to being regarded with a good deal more than uh, just dissent with a certain kind of scorn because praying appears from a secular point of view to be of all activities the most useless and superstitious. Um, and yet it is after all at the heart of the matter. I mean, Everything that I said about what it is for a theist to believe in God presupposed that what theists are rooted in is a practice of prayer. Um, and the way in which we pray is what directs us towards God. And then what I've said so far has to be modified because I talked about what we do and say when we pray, whereas in fact, of course, at the heart of prayer is a particular kind of silence in which we listen. And that the notion of us as listening is people is enormously important here. Um, St. John of the Cross is the key author here, and Edith Stein's reflections on St. John of the Cross are a wonderful example of how to take what John of the Cross taught and extend it further in a way that makes it inform our lives better. This is just to give signposts. One final, one? Sure. final question? Yeah, thank you. Perhaps you've begun to answer uh, the question I have with, with your last comment. Um, I, I agree that it's one of the principal tasks of a theist philosopher to engage in conversation our secularist counterparts. But I'm, I'm struck as well, uh, thinking about Brother Skarin Matsov, that Alyosha reaches a point where he realizes that uh, he needs to walk away from Ivan. And struck as well um, by Anscombe's comment in Modern Moral Philosophy that um, when engaging in, in debate with somebody who's abandoned moral absolutes, there's, there's really no argument to be had that the person shows a corrupt mind. So um, at, at what point should we just walk away? Well, just one footnote to 
what Elizabeth Anscombe says there. What she says is obviously completely right about philosophical debate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there may come a point at which there's nothing more to be said. You can't, in fact, go any further. Mm -hmm. But if you're talking about, when we talk about people who don't believe that there are any unconditional affirmations in morality, and the point about conversation with people when they're not just engaging in philosophy is that you don't actually know whether they believe in unconditional affirmations or not. And often they don't know whether they believe in unconditional affirmations or not. Mm -hmm. So I have known a number of philosophers who held views that almost everybody in this room would find deplorable who in the most embarrassed way possible behave enormously well in their actual lives. And it seems to me well worth continuing the dialogue with these people, not on the basis of their ostensible beliefs, but on the basis of what they are rather than what they in seminars say they are.